What's going on everybody? Welcome back Jacked Up Fishing. Well, I'm putting an unusual video out on a Sunday. Um, I was pretty stoked. I went yesterday down to Cocoa Beach. My buddy Jim Ross invited me to come down and do a podcast with him to discuss other side of the Gulf Stream fishing for yellowfin tuna. He wanted to know techniques, tr tips and tricks that we do and just discuss the outdoors. Had a great time with him. And I uh, also want to give him a plug, Catch a Memory Outdoors. Go check it out. It's on Facebook. They do a podcast every Saturday morning, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. And if you, don't, if, you, if you don't get a chance to see it then, you can always go back and check it out at a later date. But I wanted to put this one on my page just to give him some support and let you guys check out some of this yellowfin tuna techniques and tr tips and tricks and stuff that we do to catch yellowfin that might help you. So... uh Let's get into the podcast. Here we go. Hey guys, the new website is finally complete. You can check out our latest catches, see what's biting, as well as pick up a jacked up hat. We have different colors to choose from and they're very good quality. Also, if you live in or are visiting the Central Florida area, I am now running fishing charters inshore and offshore. All the details are at jackedupfishing.com. If you have any questions, you can also message me directly from the site. So go check it out. I hope to have you guys on the boat with me making a jacked up video for all your friends and family to see. All right, back to the video. Coming up next, it's Captain Jim Ross, host of Catch a Memory Outdoors, the most informative, longest running outdoor program on the Space Coast. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Hey guys and gals, welcome. It's another edition of Catch a Memory Outdoors right here on WWBC 1510 AM. We appreciate you guys tuning in every Saturday right here to see what's going on up and down the Space Coast with the fishing and the outdoors. Of course, we're going to try to talk a little bit of hunting. Had uh, had a pretty good uh, duck week hunting here this week from uh, some of the guys I talked to. So we'll probably get a call from Captain Jeff Cranick and some of the others, uh, see what was going on out there in the marsh and out there in the salt as well. But we appreciate you tuning in every Saturday to listen to Catch a Memory. We're on from 7 to 9 live, of course, on the uh, Facebook feed. Good morning to those of you guys out there on Facebook. We appreciate you tuning in. And then 99.9, 94.7, 100.7 .7 FM. And then, of course, the WWBC app. We're streaming live every Saturday morning right here. So you can go back and uh, listen to that uh, later as well on our archived podcast at catchamemoryoutdoors.com. I'm Captain Jim Ross, and we're going to do this thing we call Catch a Memory for the next two hours. This segment of the show is brought to you by Blue Points Marina out of Fort Canaveral. We appreciate those guys doing a fantastic job out there and being a sponsor of this show for a long time now. And uh, we really, really appreciate uh, what they've done for this show. And anyway, uh, we have got a couple of things we need to talk about this morning. And the first thing is, is we've got uh, some cold weather moving in. The second thing is, is you can give us a call here on our on our call in line at 321-632-1000. That's 321-632-1000. And you can listen to us uh, on, the, on the radio and also give us a call and ask some questions if you want. I've got uh, Captain Bill Coppage in this morning from Jacked Up Fishing Charters out of Pond Sinley. Good morning, sir. How's it going, man? I'm doing good. I appreciate you coming in this morning. I appreciate morning. you having me, man. It's a real uh, good day to have it with this weather, right? I'm telling you. Five <laughs> to seven in, in hard out of the north. Yeah. And, and, we've got, uh, and, and we've got a special guest. That you that you brought along today? Yeah, yeah, I brought my neighbor. He's a wingman, so <laughs> you know what, man? He fished with me a lot. He knows the drill, so um, it's been a it's been a good time having him next to me. He fishes with me all the time. So, Mark. so, so, Mark, you are um, not. Uh, you know, I, I, we hadn't met before, so I was thinking that uh, that Bill brought his mate in because you know a lot of times captains yeah. bring us in and make that kind of thing. But you just, you just, you don't even, you don't even get the title. You just get to help, help clean the boat, but you get to fish. And that's important because mates don't get to fish most of the time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. It always helps having a second set of hands on the boat. You have got you know, that. You know, I'd, I'd pay to be there. You know? <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. My well, son's my you mate. Just he's, like, he just, uh, <laughs> he's in bed right now. He's not getting up. <laughs> Well, my son decided that uh, on the coldest weekend of the year, he was going to go north to Asheville, North Carolina. Ooh. And he got off the plane yesterday and he sends me this video and he says, what is this stuff? And it's sleeting and snowing a little bit. And, and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, this is ridiculous. I'm ready to come home already. Yeah. And I'm like, not before you send me a snow angel picture. Mm -hmm. And he says, that is not happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
get that. I get that. I'm not a fan of the cold myself. So. But we've got some cold out there. It's, you know, it's been getting colder as the morning goes on. I uh, left the dogs out around 2 a.m. this morning. They always seem to, you know, 2 a.m. is like it's like time. Man, what's up with that? Yeah, I don't know, man. It's, <laughs> it's time. That. We got to we got to go. We got to go. And of course, you know, when they got to go, they got to go. So I let them out. I'm like, ah, it's not too bad, you know. Yeah. And then I got out this morning and let them back out at you know, about 5:30. And yeah, it's coming. Yeah, you know, that cold's rolling in. Yeah, it so. rolled through quick that front yesterday. I was out uh, in some inshore, near shore reefs out of Ponch yesterday, and we were in a 23 footer, and we. Just gl- glided right on out, no no issues at all. <laughs> you know how you get to fishing, you start for not looking around. Mm-hmm. Like, oh man, it's a little getting pretty windy here. Right around, <laughs> right around yeah, right around one thirty, two o'clock at a Canaveral, it started picking up, and I'm like, ah, it's time to roll it on back in. Exactly. So, did you guys get any of those big blue fish yesterday? We I know didn't. I heard we... the big blues were run back up there. They were down at Canaveral last week. Yeah, I heard that. And I heard I some for... big ones. Too. Yeah, I looked all over for them yesterday. I ran. I ran from the mouth of the port all the way up to the tip of the cape, the false cape, around, you know, zigzag this. I couldn't find them anywhere. So yeah, I, I, mean, I was just like, you know, the water temperature was a little higher, though. It was down in the 62, 63 degree range whenever we were getting them last week. And it's back up to 65 now. Right. And, you know, a lot of times you think, oh, well, it's still cold. But apparently it's enough that it pushed them back up to you guys. Well, I don't know. I was out yesterday and we hit, uh, we were hitting five mile reef. It's like a, you know, mm-hmm. out that way, and then we hit around 12 miles, all that. And we can, the bite was slow, and the water temperature was 60 degrees yesterday yeah. morning. So, um, we were looking for them too, actually, because they're, they're pretty fun, you know. I, the fellow that I talked to when they were coming down was fishing off the main street pier and was doing really well off. Right. Um, apparently, he, he wasn't seeing them in schools, really, which, when they got to Canaveral, they were schooling. Yeah. They were acting like they were spawning, actually. They were daisy chained up, circling, you know, just like any other fish that you would see spawning. <clears throat> and it, of course, you know, with bluefish, with any fish that gets in a, in a school and they start getting aggressive, anything you throw in there. But we were throwing top water because that's just the funnest thing to throw. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so, um, it, it was instant. I mean, the, the, the lure would barely get wet and there, boom, there's a, you know, 10, 15 pound bluefish on it. Um, but he said he was just catching them off the pier using cut baits. Right. So apparently they were down deeper. They were running, you know, along the beach there. But he wasn't seeing schooling fish. But he was catching quite a few of them. I checked around. We checked around Sunglow. We looked around there. We okay. Seen, uh, Nothing to the north. beach a little bit there. But, um, yeah, we didn't see anything. There. What about um, weak fish or anything like that? Yeah, they're stacked. Right? Okay. Yeah, that's uh, unbelievable. Within, you know, a couple miles of you know, well, you, you got, you, yeah, you got the ghost ship, you got uh, the tire reef, you right. got the, you know, the, the sun glow, the main street, you know, all those rocks in there. Stack. Yeah. How about sheephead? I've been, uh, this year was our best pre spawn sheephead bite I've had in a long time. Um, I started, I usually start every year. It's kind of like my ritual, right? At Thanksgiving day. Right. Um, to go try them, goof around, something new. And, and hope that it's cool enough that and, they're actually uh, wanting to play a little bit. We have actually gotten some really good sheep that pre spawn. Um, now, at, in our end of the leaf, they're out spawning right now. It's a little slower at the jetty and inshore because, you know, they're mm-hmm. not doing the thing. Um, but uh, one month from now, they're going to come back and they're going to be hungry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. So. When they're chasing pompano jigs, you know, you know, yeah. it's they're they're hungry. Yeah. Because that January, late January, early February time frame, when they come back into the beach and get around those rocks again, it's like, oh, yeah, it's it's game on. Yeah. We caught a big one yesterday. Uh, and what's funny is you'll hook up. one and you're pulling him up and there'll be two or three following them. They look like bluefish chasing yeah. one another or jacks chasing one that's another. And you're like, that's a sheephead doing that, you know? Yeah. So. It's been a pretty, pretty good year this year so far. And like I said, next, 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 uh, next month will be really good. I usually commercial fishing. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, you know, anytime that you can make an extra dollar. Yeah, I just switched jobs. I was in the medical field. I started off. I'll give you a little backstory. I um grew up as born and raised Ponce Inlet. Mm-hmm. Um, charter fished my whole younger, eighteen to twenty five. Right. You know, on the boats on the Critter Fleet, which is now fleet, gone. Yeah. Um, I also did a bunch of sport fishing, you know, charters every summer, and then I transitioned to commercial. So I had commercial fish from 
you know, in my mid twenties to about twenty eight, twenty six, twenty eight, something like that. But um, I would commercial fish from like September all the way till you know March or April, and then I would charter fish from you know the whole summer. Right, that's the, that's the season. That's when the season. But yeah. also the commercial seasons in the winter because you do row ball, you do, uh, sheep's head, you do uh, Spanish mackerel, you know anything like yeah. that. And um, so that's that's how I got into that. And then I went back to school. And when got a nuclear medicine degree, which Mark does nuclear medicine too. So oh, okay, it's pretty wild that he's my neighbor. But um, did that, and I've been doing that since you know my mid, you know, early thirties, I guess you would say. Now I'm about to turn fifty. I'm step back, got a state job, back into charter fishing because it's always been my passion. You know, I yeah. love it. I love it to death. So the camaraderie. I still talk to the people I commercial fish with twenty years ago. So. uh now I got my commercial license, got my restricted species license again. I don't even know how much I'm in depth I'm going to go with it, but you know, and I'm charter fishing, so we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. It's going to be a good year, you know. It, it should fun. be. Yeah, it should be. And what kind of boat are you running? Um, I have three boats right now, actually, because you know, there's not one boat that does it all. No. Unfortunately, I wish no. there was. Yeah. Um, but right now I, I have my other side boat, which is a 37 Sea Hunter, um, and that, that's my long range boat I use offshore. Um, for everything the, the mileage really sucks on it <laughs> yeah yeah it was a good mile uh, and a half to the gallon one, so. one, one oh yeah, it's not one that's even worse oh. but that thing it just eats it eats yeah. and no matter what it's a good boat. And then i have a 21 shoal water bay boat to cat um yep. i use that for my you know my inshore near shore stuff and then i have a gigging boat that i'm building right now um, for some nighttime gigging gotcha gotcha little little uh, bow steerage no, uh, it's going to be a John boat with a railing on it. Um, okay. It's an extra wide 18 foot John boat with a railing. I'm going to use it for chartering. So, uh, light it up. It'll look like a space shuttle going yeah, right, on. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, so. Do some shrimp and charters in it as well, maybe? Uh, maybe. I don't know, man. I, I was thinking about that, actually. I was talking to a buddy of mine that's, uh, he has Jetty Rocks, um, YouTube channel. He's a real, pretty big YouTube channel. And I was like, hey, man, I'm thinking about doing some shrimp and charters. He's like, dude, he's like, you're, you're really risking it because people could fall or, you know, in that kind of tight environment, shrimping. I was like, maybe nighttime I could do, but not daytime, you know. We do a lot of daytime shrimping. Yeah, cast there. netting and stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. But the jellies and all that, you know, you know, low gunnels, you know, somebody could really fall and hurt themselves. And I need to be weary of that, you know, so. Yeah. Um, but maybe dipping. Dipping would be kind of cool, but you still need a bigger boat for that than a John boat, unfortunately. You know? We do. It's just now starting right now. The shrimp, they're just... Well, um, the beginning of December, there was a pretty good run that came through Oak Hill. Mm -hmm. And then Christmas time, by Christmas time, it had died right out. So it should start picking back up. We got the full moon, so it yeah. should yeah. be doing, you know, happening any day now. The tide was moving last night, was it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's as low as I've seen. Yeah, it was going out pretty good. Well, that's, uh, you know, a lot of different things you got your, got your fingers in. Um, real quick, you know, before we go to break. What is nuclear medicine? It's a medical field where we kind of inject a radioisotope and we'll look at a certain organ of your heart, or of your body. Like it looks at the workings, physiology of your, of your body. So you can either do like liver scans, bone scans, heart scans, and you're doing an imaging procedure that couples with it to show them, you know, what organ you're looking at and if it's functioning correctly is what, is what we're doing. So it's, oh. it's medical imaging. You've got MRIs. Got CAT scans, you've got X rays, you've got ultrasound. Everyone's familiar with those. You've also got nuclear medicine, so it's another form of taking pictures of the body. Um, Just using you're using a different yeah. modality. What yeah. sets yeah. nuclear medicine apart is your imaging organ function as opposed to the structure. So when you're doing your CAT scans, your MRIs, you see what your organs, your body structures look like based on their physical characteristics. Nuclear medicine is a, a organ function. Because you're tracing where that isotope is going. Right, exactly. You have different okay. isotopes get metabolized or processed or localized to different organs. Um, and they emit radiation or camera detection. Gotcha. Yeah. Kind of like putting uh, aquatic uh, tags on the redfish and then watching what they're listening to where they go. Yeah. yeah. Around the lagoon system. Right? Similar, yeah. I've yeah. done that. So that's pretty neat. Yeah, it's a good deal. I, I, I enjoy it. Now I work for the state. I inspect all the facilities that actually do that. Um, any nuclear, anything that produces uh, <laughs> ionizing radiation, I expect. So it's pretty cool. Like the Space Center has some things we do. The port, you know, they have the the cruise ships have their X-ray baggage things. Right, right. Check them out. It's a it's a good it's a good job. I like it a lot. 
That's well, that's interesting that you're able to transition from one thing to the next to the yeah. next. And now it's allowing you to go back and fish again. Yeah. Yeah. Which is really cool because, you know, it's uh, something, a passion of mine. Uh, I, I love the outdoors, you know, period. Anything. I could do anything outdoors. And uh, it, this job enables me to get more offshore, more out in the woods, you know, I'm down, you know, as long as I can make the bills, right? <laughs> as long as you're getting paid at the end of the day, right? That's right. Well, guys and gals, we'd love to hear from you. 321-632-1000 is our call in line. Give us a shout here on Catch a Memory Outdoors. Captain Bill Coppage, his neighbor Mark, and myself, Captain Jim Ross, are going to be right back after these messages, so don't go away. Hey, guys and gals, welcome back. We're going to go right back to uh, talking about uh, Ponce Inlet and what's going on with Ponce Inlet with Captain Bill Coppage and his neighbor Mark here. This morning, I want to say good morning to you, those of you guys and gals out on Facebook. Real quick, though, got a bunch of people on this morning. Got William Stratton on, uh, Dave Belays is on with us, uh, uh, Craig Like and Carl Harmon. And good morning, sir. Hopefully, you're in the duck line. Uh, Jesse Dance, getting ready to have old birthday party bonfire. Going to go over and see that thing here next weekend. So, uh, want to wish him a happy birthday uh, ahead of time. Um, John Kip, Captain John Kip up at Ponce Inlet, Orson Tarver. Captain Mark Gibson, Jonathan Raby. Uh, who else have we got here? Gregory Lund. Captain Greg, good morning, sir. Uh, no, you're not on the water this morning. It's a little chilly to be offshore today. Um, Greg Perotti, Josh Cox, and uh, Daniel Hart, and quite a few more. Chris Kaminsky looking in from Vero Beach as well. Appreciate you guys and gals tuning in every Saturday. You know, Bill, we were talking about that 37-footer of yours. And these days, the last 10 years, the boats and the equipment are absolutely game changing compared to when I, a shallow water, started off in a John boat kid, then worked his way up to working on a 42 Hatteras and fishing the other side at the 120 mm -hmm. boom. Those days, we barely even had radar. I mean, we had a closed array radar. We didn't even have an open array radar, okay? Closed array radar and a big set of binoculars. And we would just drive around in the middle of the ocean, 90 miles offshore, 100 miles offshore, looking for packs of birds. And we didn't have water temperature charts. We didn't have, you know, we didn't have any of these things. Today, I mean, I, as an example, I, I look at some of the products that are, that are available today. You can sit at your house the night before. You can pull up your, your chart plotter. You can overlay your temperature, your altimetry, your chlorophyll data. And some of them even tell you, hey, if you want to catch Wahoo, go here. You want to catch Dolphin, go there. You want to catch. They actually have pre-programmed areas that they'll tell you, hey, go check this area. But you can look at the temperature charts. You can look at where the brakes are, where the eddies are, those sorts of things. And you can have an idea of, hey, I need to go 78 miles on a southeast heading, and I should hit this body of water, and there should be something there. Rather than just driving around like Stevie Wonder, hoping to see something you know, and, or bump into something, literally. Um, so with this 37 footer, and I'm sure you've got an open array radar on it. Yeah. Um, you break the inlet, the radar's running, man. I mean, you're scanning on the ride out. If you don't, if you didn't have a predetermined program as to where you wanted to go, a plan to go somewhere, you just turn it on and let's say, let's, let's see what we come across. Well, with that radar, being able to scan out as far as you can. I mean, we can see birds at six miles now. Right. You know, it's, that's that's got to make your job a whole lot easier. Well, that's the, that's the one thing. It's funny you say that, actually, because I gave two seminars, one at um, Central Florida Offshore Anglers and one mm -hmm. of the Flor Florida Sport Fishing Association, which is down this way in yep. Melbourne. Um, great group of guys, by the way. But that's my first thing that I like to tell people during a seminar is that's the, that's the biggest thing is information. Getting information yeah. is the most important thing to tuna fishing out there. Because like you just said, I, I downloaded a rip charts map the morning of. Yeah. And if it's not clear enough, then I try to go back and find one that is clear enough and they have a bunch of day but before also, or even the day before yeah, that. You, know? they, you download it. And if you download it to your phone and keep that on, it'll, it'll stay on your phone. Keep that app open. It'll stay on your phone and it gives you a, a track when you're running which is really cool because then you can see, like you said, the eddies, the water temp changes, um, you know, all the different, you know, bathy, all that stuff. Yeah. It's a big deal, man. It, that is the most important thing when tuna fishing because otherwise you're just, like you just said, you're just riding around a desert. The radar is 
the next biggest thing for tuna fishing. You have to have a radar. You have to have an open array. I have a bunch of people that try to go out there. And, you know, when I first started, I, st- I just started tuna fishing about four years ago, really. I've been to there and I, I went offshore fishing, went for tuna, never caught them when I was younger, you know, because mm-hmm. I was more like you, like you. We were intro. You start off with a job, but, you know, you go offshore. And, you know, when I was in my um, early teens and early 20s, um, or late teens, early twenties, we would go fishing on charters, but we would only go to the Gulf Stream. Right. Yeah, right. that was our normal. And that's an trip. easy thing to find. I yeah. mean, you just drive until you see the rip, and then you're like, okay, correct, <laughs> correct. <here."> so, uh, <laughs> you know, going out there was a new thing for me up to four years ago. Um, it's been a, it was a the first year was a learning experience, but after that, it's been like we've been hot. I mean, it's just like it's a, it's a no brainer. You know, it's pretty easy. Like you just said, with all the new tools and that, it, the fish don't stand a chance anymore. You know? They really don't. <laughs> so, I mean, they yawn. You know, they're yeah. they're done. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's it's a scary thing too in that aspect as well because even just the inshore, I've noticed a difference over the last twenty years with the spot lock. You know, you don't even got to anchor correctly anymore. Yeah, you know that's a game changer. It really is. You know, I mean, not mention the spots. You know, all your spots you're going to. So technology has definitely impacted that. You know. Um, like we don't even get it uh, like up there in Ponce. You probably still get a little bit of a mahi season. We don't get it here. The only way I do get it is when I go off to the other side. I find them over there on the other side of the stream. Yeah. Well, surprisingly, this side of the stream the last couple of years has not been nearly as productive as the other side. Right. It really hasn't. Yeah. Um. It. And I think it's my personal opinion of it is that we don't have as many dolphin as we once had. Okay. So if you think of, just think of cows in a field. Okay. If you've got a thousand cows in a field, they're going to spread out and cover a lot of ground. If you've only got 300 cows in that field, they're not going to cover nearly as much ground. And so I think what's happening is our dolphin populations are shrinking to the point that they're not spread out all over the water column and, and you know, from 70 feet to 700 feet you know they are concentrating just in the thoroughfares and those so, so there's not there's there's enough room for them to stay concentrated if you if that makes any sense yeah rather there's more fish they have to spread out because they there's they have to have food they've got to they've got to search more water to find more food and i think what's happening is with all of the heavy heavy industrial ship uh, long line that's going on down in the Caribbean and down through the through um, the, the the southern Atlantic even now. There's I mean they're starting all the way off of you know the coast of of Brazil and the air, and areas down there. You've got 200 foot processing ships that are running 40 mile sets every night, and there's 20 ships out there all doing the same thing. 20 ships, 40 miles a night, 100 foot every 100 foot there's a dropper, and they start picking off dolphin and tuna and sailfish and everything else. You know that's a that's a heck of a gauntlet for the dolphin to have to get through to get up to us, and I think that's what we're seeing. We're seeing that diminished population is uh, allowing the fish to stay in a more concentrated zone. They don't have to get out of that zone anymore to go find find fish, find bait like they used to, yeah, or I find agree. food like they used 100%. to. One hundred percent. I think uh, there's I think there's two things honestly. I think um, we get a a, a very big um, current rip. From the Bahama area, it comes off the point near the exactly area. because and of it, their it shoots, migration. And yeah. It shoots on the other side, where our normal mahi comes from down south, and they migrate up and down the coast. Um, you know, over the years, like you said, you know, even down in the Keys, where we can keep, you know, we would keep like sixty fish in a day. You know, right. and you know, back then we didn't realize it, but now, I, like, I'm not really like one of them guys about rules and stuff like that, but I think on certain things. You know, like the flounder rule, 12 inch rule. I, I agree with that. It should be a 14 inch flounder. Yeah. Like, what are you going to do with a 12 inch flounder? Same thing with the mahi, 20 inch mahi. What are you going to do with a 28, 20 inch mahi? It's 60 of them. Right. So, like, for real, like, um, you know, I think we need to practice a little bit of con- conservation when it comes to that point. But um, I think that's why we don't get them on the inside yeah. as we used to because we're well, getting hammered of, down south. All of those fish that would be. Just off of the reef in Isla Mirada, yeah, in, in Miami, in Lauderdale, they there's with there being fewer numbers, the fish that are running up through there. By the time they get to St. Lucie, Sebastian, Canaveral, 
Now you're, you're not talking about a whole lot of fish because there's been a lot of them caught. Yeah. So by the time they have to get all the way to ponds, I mean, and then in St. Augustine and Jacksonville, the same way, you don't see the numbers. But here's the here's the interesting thing, because the yellowfin tuna do the same thing. Right. So they the, the main migration route is on the on the eastern side of the Gulf Stream. And a lot of times they come up on the east side of the Bahamas. Even They're not even on the west side of the Bahamas they're on the east side. So as they come around and then they come off of Matanilla and then they come up and hit the stream, they ride the west, the eastern edge of the stream almost past Ponce before they start to cross over because St. Augustine, now all of a sudden St. Augustine and Jacksonville, you can start to catch yellow fins in the stream or on the western side of the Gulf Stream because they've had a chance to kind of come on over, right. merge, if you will. That's, like 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 coming off of a, a, like an, a, an so entrance onto the 95, that. you know? It's so funny you're saying that because um, last year, I, um, I definitely recognized when Mahi was going, it was just getting ready to hit. Jacksonville were catching them. North Carolina was catching them. We didn't even get a season, and they were yep. crushing them. I was yep. like, "What's going on yep. here?" So, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about there. It's yeah, that true. that stream is is definitely a dividing line, if you will. Yeah. And with the fewer numbers of fish, I think that they're just not they're they're not having to search other areas. They're able to stay within that confined area and still have enough food. So yeah. that's that's my thought process on it. So, you know, being a flats guy, if you will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> research. That's pre- it's, it's pretty it's, uh, i can see it <laughs> well guys and gals we're going to take our next break we would love to hear from you 321-632-1000 that's our call in line give us a shout here uh, i want to say a couple more shout outs to those of you guys online uh billy grabowski is on there tim leslie good morning sir uh jim hartley's on there um ah there's another name i can't even pronounce there so uh we won't even try Dave, uh, david giovanini Appreciate Butch McCoy, all of you guys watching on Facebook. If you guys and gals that are on Facebook, if you will do us a favor and hit that share button and share the Facebook feed from Catch Memory Outdoors onto your personal feed, we're trying some experiments here to see what happens in the first couple of weeks of the year. And we're trying to see what kind of uh, growth we can achieve through, through that. So if you guys and gals can help us with that, we'd really appreciate it. Hit that share button, put it on your personal page as well. We would appreciate that. We're going to be right back with more Catch a Memory after these messages. So don't go away. Hey, guys and gals, welcome back. You know what we're going to do right now, guys? Let's um, let's get the catch conditions out of the way because there's really not much in the way of catch conditions for offshore. But we're going to talk about it anyway. Small craft advisory, obviously. <laughs> North winds today at 20 to 25 knots, sustaining that through tonight and probably well into tomorrow. Um, then it'll shift a little bit to the northeast, it looks like, maybe tomorrow evening or into Monday. Seas inside of 20 miles are supposed to be four to six feet with a dominant period of about eight seconds. And right now, the four-mile buoy at Canaveral is 67 degrees. It is not. That is a lie. It is not 67 degrees. It was 65.3 yesterday, and the high I saw was 65.3 in the morning. It was 65.6 when I got off in the afternoon. It is not 67. Anyway, um, at least that's what my Garmin is saying. (laughs) Uh, three foot seas at six seconds. I believe that. Um, Twenty mile buoy. They didn't have a temp this morning, but it doesn't really matter because it's five foot at seven seconds, and you're not going anyway. Uh, western edge of the Gulf Stream, forty five nautical miles due east of Ponce, twenty nine due east of Port, and twenty five due east of Sebastian. Current surf temps right now at Ponce, fifty nine degrees. Cocoa Beach, sixty four, and Sebastian, sixty seven. And the tides are like this. Got a low this morning at nine fifty a.m. Uh, for those of you guys that are fishing Port Canaveral this morning on that low. Um, Sheep's head and black drum bite on the sand fleas uh, right around that low tide period. High at 3.33. It's 48 degrees outside right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, 3.35 uh, p.m. is your high this afternoon, and 9.33 p.m. is your low. And then, Sebastian, uh, 9.36 a.m. is your low this morning. The high is at 3.29 p.m., and the low is scheduled for 10 p.m. tonight. But remember, the current change inside the inlet is about three hours after the actual beach tide. So keep that in mind whenever you are going down there. And then I forgot to write this down. Let me pull it up real quick here. The best times to hunt fish, the uh, sole lunar tables today, we are looking at, oh, it looks like it's pretty good right now. Let me get my glasses out here so I can see what I'm doing because my iPhone 5 lettering is so small. I need to get my glasses. Okay, so the, yeah, iPhone 5 still kicking, baby. Whoa, yeah. Still kicking. Whoa. 
Hey, and the uh, Soul Lunar Tables are brought to you by All About Archery. Uh, stop down and see Danny and Tino and the gang down there, Cheryl down there. Um, they do a fantastic job of getting you tuned up with your bows and your crossbows and stuff. Um, minor activity this morning is going to be, actually it's going to be in the afternoon. It's going to be from 12.56 p.m. to 1.56 p.m. The major's happening right now, 7.38 to 9.38 a.m. Oh, no, no, 7.09 to, to 9.09 a.m. And then tonight at 7.38 at 9 38 p.m but we are just coming into the peak of the high for this morning at right around 8 a.m so hopefully you guys and gals are bundled up and taking advantage of that uh if you're out in the duck blind hopefully the ducks are flying for you um i'm not sure if, is there anywhere that the deer season is still open uh here in zone c zone this c is still the last open? week okay the last week birthday tomorrow is gotcha gotcha so you're saying there's a chance yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 gonna walk out yeah. <laughs> well uh i tell you what guys and gals um you know it's it's gonna be one of those chilly chilly kind of days it's just is what it is i'm i may i don't know i'm thinking about it now Think about trying it. i was thinking about trying it because i have had like i've had one day in the woods one it's not right it's just, it's just not right. I need to get out a little more than that. Um, but Killed zero deer. Zero. Exactly. Exactly. You guessed it. Yeah, exactly zero. So hopefully I can, uh, I can turn that around. I don't know. We'll see. But uh, it's one of those things where I just had too many things going on and I didn't allocate the time I needed to allocate to it. But, you know, it is what it is. You know, let's talk a little bit. Um, when you're heading offshore, you were talking, you were, you were starting to talk about it, Bill, you know, your, your temperature chart, uh, to me, the temperature is the number one thing. What is your number as far as that type of information? When you're looking at your chart for you, what is your second favorite? Is it chlorophyll? Is it it's it's alter, 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 yeah, altimetry? Yeah. Altimetry, yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. That, that's the name, the name of the game. Yeah, you can find them rings starting to gather up and get somewhere on your chart. Um, I like to, and it, it overlaps with an eddy. Cool. That, that's the, that's the, that's the holy that's grail, the holy right? Grail there. Right yeah, there. yeah. That's that's the rip with the foam and the tree floating in it. <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's it. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, when you pull up these charts, now there's two different ones you can usually use them. One's called rip charts. That's what I use. Um, the rip charts is a really good app i use it it's getting more expensive um if you that's if you know how to read these maps and there, right. it, um so what i would do when i first started tuna fishing is i would buy a ross report yep because the ross report is game changer they actually give you coordinates um you got to make sure you get the right one if you're doing the other side but um i what i would do is i had rip charts already because i thought i could read it but i couldn't right so when i got the ross report i would compare it to the data that i would get because it's the same it's the same information. They're just interpreting it for yep. you. Um, which, and that's the one thing that Ross has done for so many years. They've, mm -hmm. they've, they've done a fantastic job of pinpointing, highlighting areas that, that should see increased activity. Yeah. And now lately, we've been buying them anyway. Yeah. Because yeah. even though you still can read them, it's still nice to see what they have to say yeah. because they've been doing it so long. Like you said, it's a very, very valuable asset to have when you're going offshore. You're spending thousands of dollars to go on this trip literally for just fuel you know 15 1600 bucks i was going to say your average fuel bill in a 37 foot center console how many gallons are you burning uh over 400 over 400 gallons some days at five dollars a gallon marina price mm -hmm. so do the math on that real quick guys and gals in in my book that comes to way more than what i need to be spending on on fuel right to just run around and catch nothing i need to i need to put something right. in the Something needs to be sucking on some ice if I'm going to burn two thousand dollars worth of fuel. Hundred <laughs> percent. Well, you know that's a funny thing you say that because that's how we started finding the mahi. Um, we would be running out, and we're of course we're searching for tuna, right? Right. But then you get into mahi, and it's like, man, do you leave fish to find fish? Because you're in fish. You're in them. You're yeah. in them. But you're in mahi. You know, you're here to tuna fish, but you know that's a hard call sometimes. You got to make it. Sometimes that mahi bite is hot. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and to, to walk away from these weed lines that are you know, 200 yards wide is, is a, is a, is a hard one to do. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, but uh, yeah, so that the, the main thing is, like I said, the Roth report, 
is the biggest deal. And then learning how to interpret it with the rip charts. And that's how we get to the altimetry. We get to your, your, your clarity, um, you know, chlorophyll, like chlorophyll. You, you know, um, they can even, you can even see weed lines on some of them. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's, it's amazing the information that is available to us now. It wasn't 15, 20. I'm not a ago. fan of the Garmin ones, the overlay on the Garmin ones per se, because I just, I, I, it's more of like a, a block bar graph, if you will. Like there's pink over here for tuna. You know, I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan yeah. of that at all. When people, I, I fish with people like, hey, the tuna over here, you know, that's pink over here. And I'm like, no, no, we're catching tuna right here. Yeah. There's no need to go over to the pink. Yeah, we don't need to go there. <laughs> you know, like I've seen that before in my, in, in fishing with people and it's, it's, you know, you need to look at what you're really looking. You need to learn what you're looking at. You know, if you don't know how to read it, buy the chart that shows you how to read it. Compare your data, you know, research, you know, because yeah. that's how you become a good fisherman, doing your research, right? Putting in the time. So um, that, that, it's a funny thing you said that, too, because I, you were given the report. Are they going to replace the buoy out there? The, the weather buoy, the 120 buoy. I don't know. I haven't heard. It's been gone a year. Yeah, no, I haven't. I haven't. Yeah, I'd be kind of curious there. because we actually went out there to do an over, overnight trip probably a year ago, maybe a little later, maybe a year, under a year ago. And we get out there and there's a 70 foot sport fisher idling around there. I'm like, oh, well, the buoy must be over there. We go over there and he's like, hey, man, where's the buoy? I'm like, what are you talking about? You're not sitting on the buoy? He's like, no, that was the first it day. Gone. We were going to do an overnight trip. So guess what we did? We idled around, idled around all night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Pointed into the current so that you don't end up off of Georgia. <laughs> yeah. We sat around and some of us slept, some of us were miserable. It was, just, yeah. it was terrible. Terrible. But yeah, we, yeah, so I'm just curious because that, you know, that chain from that buoy was a big game changer. I'm sure you know. From oh, yeah. Back when everybody used to go there. Well, that was, I mean, that was our end game was to get to the buoy. Mm -hmm. um, when we left Port, it was okay. We're heading to the we're heading to the buoy. Whatever we come across on the way is kind of the bonus, yeah, or the find, if you will, um, because we didn't have the different things. You know, we did start to get Roth charts back in the late nineties, but other than that, we did we had closed array radar. I mean, once we got open array radar on that boat, I was like, oh my goodness, yeah. are you kidding? When I can come out of the mouth of the port. And I can ping the Bahamas on my 90 mile setting. Yeah. I was like, whoa. And then when you figure out how to dial it in so that you can start to pick birds up. Now, back then, they weren't nearly as powerful. They weren't nearly as sophisticated. We were reading birds at a mile and a half, right? Maybe two miles. Uh, Eddie Dwyer had one that was, he had like a six foot array. He was picking them up at three ish miles on the ticket boat back in the, the first ticket that was, that was out there. Um, so it, it helped, but it wasn't what it is now right. what it is now is ridiculous so hey guys and gals we're going to take our break when we come back we've got a whole other hour of catching memory we're going to be talking about uh all kinds of fun stuff with captain bill coffage and myself captain jim ross and our buddy mark so don't go away we're going to be right back after this message of catching memory coming at you so guess what we are about to do that right now i'm captain jim ross and for those of you that are just tuning in we appreciate you joining us here at catching memory outdoors uh, i want to say good morning to uh, all of those of you out there watching on facebook as well as all of the ninety, uh, the the ninety nine point nine, the ninety four point ninety four point seven, and the one hundred point seven listeners on our FM signal, and then of course download the WWBC app. You can listen to us anywhere in the world on the WWBC app, or streaming at catchamemoryoutdoors dot com. You can listen to us uh, anywhere uh, there. Plus, if you miss the show, you want to go back and hear it again. You can always go back to either the Facebook feed, the Catch a Memory Outdoors Facebook page, or you can go back to catchamemoryoutdoors dot com. Click on that archive tab, and we've got years worth of podcasts stored there for you. So if you want to hear something that you missed, you can always go back. If you want to hear something again, you can always go back. We appreciate you guys and gals uh, going back and checking out this archive podcast there. Bill Coppage is in with me for this uh, for this second hour again, and uh, our buddy Mark's in with us as well. And uh, Mark, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, you were talking about some of the things that you like to do, some of the types of fishing that you like to do. And yesterday was it yesterday you were out or the day before you were out? Uh, yesterday evening. So what? So what were you doing yesterday evening? Because it started to get a little nasty down in my place. So. Well, and actually, we we were able to uh, hide from the wind. Uh, me and the girlfriend went out, did a little top water, zero spook. Nice. We had our small rods and a zero spook tied up and tucked away back in the mangroves and just enjoyed the sunset. And um, to it, it was. 
stacked with six inch Jack Ravel and 12 inch blue. Well, we had a heck of a time with them. Well, I tell you what, man, anytime that you can get a top water bite, I don't care what the fish is. Mm -hmm. Top water is it. Yeah. That, that is the best bite. I agree. The, the second, Anywhere. The second the best. Offshore, best, inshore. Yeah. If it's top water, oh, yeah. it's on. The uh -huh. second best is what we were talking about with Captain Mike Mann earlier in the show. Watching those fish crawl on the banks with their backs out of the water, and then they come up on a minnow or a shrimp or a little crab, and they just pounce on it. I think I think that's the second mm -hmm. best bite. And, the, and the, I think, I, and, and personally, my favorite is when they're crawling like that with their back out of the water, and you cast to them, and they run, and then they make a U-turn. That is my favorite, ultimate favorite. When they turn around and come back and nail you <laughs> and they, in that wake they put, you yeah. know, that's, that's, yep. that's amazing. That little right? swirl. That's what little you live for. It looks like a right? donut. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. See the I love it. Yeah. Love it. That See is bite. cool. That is cool. So, you know, Bill, we were talking about running to the other side, and we were talking about uh, the, the temperature is it, and then the altimetry. And for those of you that don't know what altimetry is, that is an – it, it, it's the upwellings and downwellings that occur throughout the ocean. So the ocean, you think of it, oh, it's flat. Well, it's not because you've got upwellings that's bringing cold water, cold nutrient water, uh, and typically planktons that feed bait fish that then feed bigger fish with them. So you get these slight, get these rises, and and they're only inches. It's, you know, it, you know, if you get a foot rise on an alt, uh, on an altimetry chart. You're like, whoa, yeah. You know, I'm calling in sick today. I'm, I got to go. I got to be there. Yeah. You know, you get that kind of a rise. Um, but then where the where the ocean is sinking or the water is sinking, those are typically not good places to fish. And so that's why when you said altimetry, I was right on cue with that because I was like, you know, when I was when I was running uh, offshore and we were fishing the, the the circuit, this kingfish circuit. You know, altimetry was our, our number two go-to. Yeah. And then we started looking at things like rips, weed lines, chlorophyll, that sort of thing. And water clarity to me almost came in last yeah. for kingfish. Um, they like dirty water. They, they really do. Yeah. Kingfish will they'll feed in dirty water. They like some, that green Some of the water. biggest kingfish I've ever caught, I've caught on dead low tide right outside the surf break. I mean, yeah. it does, it's as dirty as the water is going to be for the day. Right. And yet some of the biggest fish I've ever caught there's 50 plus pound fish. They're all in that. Well, not all, but they're in that dirtier water like that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, another thing is too is like I can tell you right now, I've been fishing these tuna for four years, pretty solid. Like that's my number one thing. That's my favorite fishing favorite ever. thing to do. Um, I've been to the buoy like twice, three times. I never make it there. <laughs> I, I always find the fish beforehand. Before then, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, always. I mean, I have people that, oh, we went to the buoy. I'm like, why? Why'd you go to the buoy? We found now, them at 72 miles, or we found them at 86 miles, or we, yeah, you know. Every time. Another thing is, is like, a lot of times we'll fish in the morning. We leave it, we usually leave around 4, mm -hmm. maybe 3.30. Because how hyped we are. <laughs> like, this, you know, we start fishing them in February, too. But when we, get, when we leave, we get out there, we'll catch fish from daybreak until about 10. And then you have that afternoon lull. You got that right? lull, yeah. That is the biggest argument in my boat. What do you do in that? Do you go to the buoy? Because, you know, that's a 40-mile round trip. Right, right. You know, or do you stay in that line? Because right now, you know, you're in a line. It's a north-south line. When you find the tuna, you need to stay in that, that north-south mm -hmm. line. Don't go east-west and look for more fish because they're on that line. You know how many times I've ran and burned 100 gallons of fuel looking around when I shouldn't have. You know, like, you I run it. Right we talk about it all the time. Yeah. We have our friends meeting at hunt yeah. camps and stuff. It's like, man, Bill ran out there. He ran, we burned 450 gallons of fuel, you know, this and that. And it's true. It's true. For nothing. But you you get the itch. Like, I need to run east. I need to run east. But you don't always got to run east. You, once you find fish, it's the same thing. Why leave fish to find fish, you know? Um, you just have to wait for them to turn back on. again. You do. Or find a different pod that head north-south. Because they're in that line. It's a rip. You know, it's a temperature change. Another thing is, is like you just said earlier, you get that Dwyer Canyon and all that. There's an updwelling there. It comes from the Bahamas. It swoops over there and it comes up. And that's why it's called the Dwyer Canyon. Yep. You know, from Ed Dwyer. He's a famous tuna fisherman. You know, like they wouldn't have named it Dwyer Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if there's not something there. So that's a big deal. You know, uh, you need to search your spots. You know, like I always head towards the buoy. 
on the way, I like to turn. I have certain spots I like to try because I know that there's a dwelling there, an updwelling. Yeah. That I like to hit beforehand, and sometimes it saves me and hundreds, like, yeah, of gallons of fuel. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's, it's a big deal. And, and time and running and burning time mm -hmm. and missing the bite. And I have so saved on. the day multiple times. I went to the towards the buoy, headed 120 miles, 130 miles. The buoy for me is 144 miles. Out of ponds. Out of ponds. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, you know, if I go to the buoy, it's a big That's deal. That's a hike. It's a big deal. Um, I've struck out. The day. <laughs> I've saved the day coming back on the way in and found fish. Yeah. 90 miles, 100 miles, you know, multiple times. Um, you know, some days I've last hour of the day. Like, if we're sometimes we're not satisfied. We call it satisfied. Um, when you get out there and you, you've caught some fish, you're just not satisfied. You only, then, got, you only got a handful of fish, and you're like, man, we, we just need not we just get time. one more pack and get three more knockdowns kind of thing, you know? Yeah, so sometimes we'll stay for the evening. Yeah. There's not a lot of people do that, and that's game changer. I have saved the day in the last hour of the day, last hour of daylight of the day. We've been running, running, running and gunning, last hour of the day, on birds, just, and it's solid. I got videos on the YouTube channel, just crazy. Last hour of the day, we've just laid them, yep. just laid them, you know? And it was slow all day. And you save the day, you know, it's, and that, that's what's cool about it. You know, it's like tuna fishing is different than what I've ever done in my life. It's a run and gun style. There's no sitting around blind trolling. If you're blind trolling, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. You're doing it wrong. You're just, if you're blind trolling, another thing is like trying to keep up with the birds. You're pulling baits um, and you see the birds ahead of you, you know, and you're just pulling baits behind you're, them. You're never going to catch them. You're just chasing the fish. <laughs> yeah, you're chasing, you're, you're behind them. So <laughs> another thing is, is, uh, you know, going for meat. <laughs> I have a lot of my my crew. Half my crew are very divided. Um, everybody has opinions. We're all captains, you right. know what I mean. So uh, I have a very good crew, and a lot of us like meat or value. You know, a lot of us like fake bait. We call it fake bait, which is like sterling lures. You know, uh, you know, um, nomads, yeah, stuff like that. Because you can pull them and not wash out. You can get up a because they're moving. These fish and these birds are moving, man. You got to reel up and get to them. You know, that's the main thing. Their average swim speed is probably about 10 to 12 mile yeah. an hour. And then when they get on a bite and a feed and they're chasing, now it can be 18. Yeah, 18. it's quick. You cannot catch them. Pull it. If you've got lines in the water, you cannot keep up with them. You've got to pull lines, get up and around them, and then reset. Exactly. 100%. A lot of times, too, is that if your crew is good enough, when you're, when you're running up to them, you're on the fish because it's not uncommon to get a solid hookup with every rod on your boat. So you got to be careful with that too. Like, you know, what kind of spread are you running? Are you running a five rod spread? Are you running a six rod spread? Are you trying to run a seven rod spread like you're fishing for mahi? It's not going to happen. It's not happening. Yeah. No. We, we run a we, five yeah, rod spread. Yeah, we ran five. And, yeah. and that's a handful. We get a five-way hookup multiple times. So um, that's, that's, you know, that's all solid, solid information um for, for for you guys and gals out there listening hey you know what we're going to take a break real quick when we come back we got a special caller on the line so don't go away we're going to be right back with more catch your memory after this message Grease and smears, fish blood, dirty footprints, and spilled food all create a mess on your boat's deck. Here's a fast and easy solution to clean them. Starbright Ultimate Extreme Clean. Just spray it on the spot, hit it with a deck brush, and rinse it off. Dirty vinyl cushions, greasy drips around your outboard, even those suspicious stains your fishing buddy always seems to leave behind don't stand a chance when you sport a little Ultimate Extreme Clean on them. Starbright Ultimate Extreme Clean works great to clean your grill and around the house. You can use it on your truck or lawnmower. It gets greasy stains out of clothing, too. Just spray it on any greasy spot, give it a light rub, and they'll look like new again. Make sure you pick up some Starbright Ultimate Extreme Clean and lose those greasy stains today. Hey guys and gals, welcome back. We appreciate you tuning in every Saturday right here to Catch Your Memory Outdoors. 
Uh, and for those of you that listen on the podcast later on, you know, hopefully you're enjoying them as well. Man, we're having a big time. Got Bill Coppage in the show and his buddy Mark. We're having a, having a fun time um, just talking about, uh, you know, what we like to talk about, the outdoors. Yeah. You know, the outdoors, fishing and hunting. You know, we were talking, Bill. Uh, you found the fish. You got in front of the fish. And we started to talk about what are you feeding to the fish? What do you like when you're offshore tuna fishing or even dolphin fishing? I mean, some guys like Dragon Valley who's you know skirted valley. Right. Some guys like naked. Me personally, when I was doing that kind of fishing, you you would not find me out there without a cedar plug. Yeah. It's old school. It doesn't look like anything in the and the best one was the wood one. I mean, you didn't even have to paint it up to look like anything. Just wood with lead on each end and a hook hanging out of it. The wood one would go down first. It was the first thing eaten every single time. Or if it wasn't the first, it, was, it wasn't the last thing in the spread. Let's put it that way. And it was a $5 lure, not a $25 lure. So I always had the cedar plug in the spread. But, you know, times change. Things change. I mean, are you still, do guys still use cedar plugs? I mean, I haven't been you know, in that. 15 years since I've been out there. You asked that. We had a... We used to hate, How hate come? offshore because they're always tangling into the five rod spread. They're always tangling. Okay. Um, but this last year, we started buying special aluminum cedar plugs, if you will. Okay. Made okay. of aluminum. And they were hot. They were hot, buddy. They were hot. <laughs> and so now we're kind of 50 50. You know, yeah. that's our shot. And we put it out there like a country yeah, mile. That's what we would do. We put it on the long rod off. And we were, because we were in a, a sport fish, we were running it off of the fly bridge. And then we'd run two flat lines, two rigger lines, and, and the shotgun off the top. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even handle it. Now I'm running, um, they're called Sterling Wide Trackers. So I don't even have to put my outriggers out. So I'm running a new lure. Um, and they actually, I, I, I bring them to all my seminars and stuff, but they have a, a diverter on them that diverts it. And you put it in your forward most rod holder, like right next to your, where your outrigger would be. Okay. And it, and it has a diverter that spreads it outside your weight. So it's kind of like oh. just to, to get your spread wider. So you got two of them, one on each side. Okay. And then you have two flat lines. That's what I'm Yeah. Um, and it's a quick retrieve, you know, like so you can get up. And now, how big are the, you said it's a Sterling? Sterling wide tracker. They're wide called. And tracker. they make different bars. They make 18 inches wide, 13 inches wide. They look like birds, you know, like the bird dredge. So it's like a planer board up north. The guys use a planer yeah, board. For very children. similar. Yeah. Very okay. similar. Yeah, yeah, but, but but in a high speed application. Correct. You're okay. you're pulling an eight, nine. Now, nine. so that's not the lure. That is just no. The it has a, it has a trailer, and on then it's and got it, the trailer. It is behind. the lure. It's the whole thing. One big. So it's like a squid teaser. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Kind of, kind of a scenario. Yeah, okay. but it's got a diverter in the way. And this guy really is named Steve. Puts them together. He's got a lot of experience up there, and he's from Jersey. They contacted me. They want to get pork and avril market. Right. And they have other couple fishermen that have been using them, and I've seen them, and man, they are game changers. I think they bring like a teaser. I think they bring up fish. more fish. Yeah, they bring up the fish and then they also catch the fish, which is unbelievable. So it makes it look like there's a school. It's a two for one. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's game changer. But I like to pull, like you said, sea witches. And my thing um, with the sea now, witches, what, what weight? That's what I was just going to say. About a two ounce. Okay. Two ounce is good with a ballyhoo in it. Doesn't have to be a horse. Doesn't have to be a medium. It, it just has to have smell. Exactly. We and you know we used to use a regular post with springs because it's quick. When you're in the bite, quickness and getting baits in the water is the most important thing. Because they, you know, when I was growing up and when I started first started, some people were like, "You gotta step down to sixty pound, you know, sixty pound leader." You know, they're smart, this and that. I I call I'm calling BS them because I'm using these wide trackers with three hundred pound mono, right? And they're catching fish just as good as anything. We've lost so many fish stepping down. But now we don't even step down. Now I'm I'm rigging um I'm rigging inline swivels. Okay. Reel through swivels. Okay. So I don't got to hand line in because every time you put a, a caveat in the middle of your catch, like hand line in 30 feet in. It's one more it's opportunity. One more opportunity for that fish to shake yeah. his head that one last time. You can just reel it in, keep that steady pressure, reel that through. So now I'm using little swivels or like 110 pound swivels tied to the braid. I use braid. Like and little then, crocs or little spros or yeah, something. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly what I'm using. And then uh, to the 80 pound fluoro, and I use about 25 feet of that to the lure. Yeah. You know, and then there's that, that swivel is a key thing. We've tried all kinds of different things. Time bimini twist, you know, with, 
you know, this and that. You have to have all that in the in your swivels in the in the in. Might as well put it twenty five feet away from the lure, you know. Right. Um. But yeah, it's a it's a it's a game changer doing that for sure. But uh, another thing is the biggest one I can highly recommend is when you're pulling when you're using sea witches, they have to have mylar. Okay. Mylar is the biggest game changer as far as catching. Sometimes I find a billy bait. It's called yeah. the cheapest bait you can buy at West Marine. Yeah. But they are big, poofy mylar bait. Yeah. They, they originated down in the Keys. <laughs> I mean, the they crush the tuna. The yeah. tuna love them. Like a big red one with the mylar shiny. They just love that that gleam, you know, that shininess in the bright, sunny days. That's where it's at right there. But now, I, are you running? So back when we were doing it, we were we were an experimental man. You know, we had everything from mold crafts to JNSs to black bards. To, yeah. I mean, uh, Islanders, uh, we started pulling lures at that point. The Azuri Bonitas, yep. the Brave Little Speedsters, the um, Marauders, the Marauders, yeah. the, all of those different kinds of things. And we, you know, in, in, but there was always, there was, there was the cedar plug. There was always the cedar yeah. plug. You know, I can give <laughs> the old school. Uh, personally, I can give or take the cedar plug. If it, if it was up to me, I would just put a bird back there and fuck. Well, of like a, 20 years ago, that was that was just what we were doing. Yeah. We were just, we were experimenting. I mean, yeah. we were trying whatever we could try. We were trying teasers at times. We were doing different things. We didn't, we didn't really have it, it dialed in. There's 20 years of knowledge now that's come to it. And so like you say, and now there's, you got these, um, you know, you got these lures that are specifically yeah. designed and have been t- and, and time tested now for, for decades in, in some cases where they're, these are, are tried and true lures that are doing the job. Well, another thing goes with the cedar cedar plugs and all that stuff is your crew. You don't have an experienced crew. You can't run that. You yeah. can't run it because you know not a lot. Not everybody knows how to fish this kind of stuff. When you're putting your spread out, which one goes out first? Which one goes out second? Your longest line obviously goes out first. Always. <laughs> well, you know, when you get in the heat of the battle, you're getting into a lot of fish. Your people are putting in and out. It happens. People start, drop that shotgun back in the middle of the spread. You're making a turn. Boom. Guess what? You got this big knot. You got to stop. Yeah. You know, and that cedar plug, it's not, the reason it's so good is because it darts around. It darts around through the, you know, <laughs> it'll dart right into the other line. Yeah. You know? yeah it, it will. Um, it will. I've had so many, <laughs> we used to get so mad about it. <laughs> just because it <laughs> it's a big, it's a big controversy on the boat. We have a lot of controversy on the boat. That's what makes it fun. Well, you know? see, that's what was, that what was, was really good about the crew we had. You know, Steve Seaman is, I think to this day, the only captain ever to catch five species of billfish in one trip. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Now he did that before I started. Yeah, working on that boat with them, but we had to have because we were doing a, a basically a twelve p.m. until we wouldn't get back until five the next day. Yeah. We had to have a two captain crew, right? So we ran two captains and a mate because of the speed of the boat. That's getting after, yeah. <laughs> but but well oiled machine, yeah. You know, Mitch, our our mate, absolutely, you know, just fantastic mate. Knew exactly where the base needed to be, how they needed to put out, you know. It was, it was, we had it dialed. And so when you came across a pack of birds, rods were going down. Big time. Rod, you know. And that's what the name of the game is. And, and, finding the birds. Yeah. Get and we them. would get to the point where, like with the yellow fins, so you would get the skippies and you'd get the black fins. You're pulling, and it, that rod, and we were running 50s and 80s at the time. Yep. You know, some of the guys are running a little smaller stuff now because it's, it's I run 70s. Higher, higher tech, you know, higher tech stuff now. But, you know, we would come across the pack of birds, the rod would go off and, zzz, you know, and then the next one, then the next one, and you'd have three or four hooked up. And then if that one stopped after 15, 20 seconds, that was a skipjack or a black fin. Mm-hmm. We'd just go straight to lock up, just straight to lock the drag down. And that thing would come up to the top and just start skipping along the like top. Like a wahoo, bring it in like a wahoo. Yeah. You know, it's coming along. And we were hoping that he fell off, that yeah. the hook ripped out of him. Because if it did, if he fell off, then we would pull back down. And keep the rod engaged in the in the fishing, yeah. and hopefully the yellow fin would be right there to pick it up. Well, another and, thing is too is the, uh, it's a good thing you point out when you do get that first hit, don't stop. Never, don't stop. That's yeah. one key element for tuna fishing. Yeah. Keep going. That's why I'm using seventies now. I'll get down to where I'm almost to the backer on that seventy. I'm like, Whoa, yeah. on that first hit because I'm trying to get the other ones to hit. I want I want as many because you're not guaranteed mm-hmm. hookups all day. Mm-hmm. 
You know, you got to capitalize on the bite when it's happening. If you get two hookups and you land one fish, that's one fish in the box. It's 50% if you, though. If you get five, <laughs> right? Yeah. If you get five lines that go down and you land three of them, well, hey, that's game changing, right? Yeah. 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 You got two more than what you have. Yes. That was the one thing. I mean, the boat virtually, until every rod possible was bent over, the boat never came off a plane. Correct. Or off of off the trolls. Yep. Ever. It just yeah, I now mean, my biggest challenge right now is getting them in faster. Mm-hmm. Get them in faster. You know, like being being more aware, like turning you know, start turning towards them a little bit. Like, yeah. Make them come in quicker because you know cut their angles. Yeah. That just like you're just like you're chasing a marlin down. Yeah. Here's one for you. When you are fighting a fish, have somebody keep an eye on where those birds are. Yeah, that's it's so true. easy to get caught up and reeling in fish, and then you know you settle down. Twenty minutes later, you go to the view, and then where's oak? Oh, where's the birds? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then they could be two, three miles away by then. You're yeah. going the other as, direction as fast as they move. You're right about that. Yeah. Yeah. Keeping an eye on which direction they headed is is big, mm-hmm. absolutely big. Well, um, you know, golly, lots of great information for guys and gals that want to try and get out there and do, you know, some of this kind of fishing on their own. But that's the other part of this. Yeah. This is what you do. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you charter this type of, of act. Yeah, you know, we just started this charter, of actually this year. I just started, um, I've been at, I've been turning down charters for two years now. Um, I had my captain's license. You know, I got a 100-ton master captain's license. Um, I've got a lot of experience, like I said, but um, I didn't want to charter a while but now I, I love tuna fishing i have the time and it's a if i can get out there more catch fish with people more you know i'm i'm down for it i love i actually love tuna fishing so um if you do get a chance go to jackedupfishing.com check out the website it shows what i'm catching i like to put you know pictures on there what we're catching you can book a trip there um and you can also check out my youtube channel um it's uh, jacked up fishing on youtube i have 10,000 subscribers close to it right now and uh you know, we post what we catch every every week. Pretty we much every that, time. Yeah, every Saturday we put out a video. So, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's good, man. It's fun. Leave a comment. You know, like the like the content and uh, right. check it out, man. It's really cool. Very cool. So, how does somebody get a hold of you? <clears throat> Do you get call you on the phone? Go to the website. Yeah, you can go to the website. It's jackedupfishing.com. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, I have all my trips there. I'm adding more trips as we go as I get more comfortable with what I'm doing. Do you have an availability calendar? I do. Sort of thing I do. Well? I have so everything on the website. Yeah. It's availability calendar. Um, I only run the charters from Friday, Saturday, and Sunday um, just because of my uh, work schedule, you know, as far as what I'm doing during the week. Um, but yet, them are the, the three days that I like to try to go. When you're doing another side trip, you don't got to worry about clients or people, you know, being out there crowding the spots. Not a lot of people 100 miles out. Yeah. <laughs> Second of all is, you know, you're coming to my house. Um, I have my own fillet table. We're not doing it at the ramp, you know, a bunch of people crowding us around. Um, we got a p- more personalized trip, and that's what I'm trying to go for. It's more of a personalized trip, not just your everyday run in the mill, go out there and catch some fish. Even though that's what I like to do, I want to give the the you know the customer yeah. experience. So, well, I tell you what, that's exactly what uh, what customers are looking for. Yeah, they want they want a personalized experience. Hey guys and gals, uh, Captain Bill Coppage, appreciate you coming in this morning. His buddy Mark and myself, Captain Jim Ross. Until next week, do exactly what we're going to do. Get out there and catch yourselves a memory. Well, that was a great podcast. Like I said, hope you guys enjoyed it. Leave a comment below if you like that kind of material. It was a longer video than I normally put out. That's why I'm putting it out today. But it was yesterday. Had a great time with Jim Ross. He's an old salt like myself. Had a lot of uh, back and forth. We actually had breakfast afterwards with a couple of friends of his as well. Great guy. Great guy. Um, go give him some love. Catch him. Catch him. Memory outdoors. Go check his website or his Facebook page. They actually broadcast them uh, podcast live Saturday mornings, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, if it's blowing out like it is this weekend, you can see. Go check it out. It's a it's a good one. You can also catch it if you missed it on on the on the uh, website. You can download it and on Facebook as well. So, all right, guys. Well, that's all I got on this video. I hope y'all enjoy it. Like I said, leave a comment. And and if you haven't yet, hit the subscribe button um, to help support me on YouTube and uh, get my videos in front of more people. All right, guys. Well, I'll see you on the next video. Jacked up. Bye.